share something. Last announcement. Uh, I, I had my coffee mug this morning, and I won't tell you who, but somebody wants this Yeti mug for Christmas. His name starts with a T and ends with Trey. Um, but uh, he commented, and Christmas is coming. So he was like, hey, it's on my Christmas list. And I was like, that's great. It happened. I got the first catalog to my house for Christmas. Anybody else get this in their house? Yeah. How many of you were like, this gives me energy and excitement? And some of, like, how many of you, this is excitement for you? How many of you, this is like, oh dear God, it is the season. Yeah, no, I am on the first, like, I remember as a kid taking these and circling them and ripping them out and leaving them as, hey parents, this is what I want. And I never got any of it. <laughs> so maybe that's like some trauma that I'm working out in my adult life now. Um, ready or not, it's coming. It's the Christmas season. But what this does for me all the more is it excites me for the Advent season. This, this calendar season as a church where we intentionally lead into the Christmas story. That at just the right time, God loved this whole world that he sent his son Jesus. Not for the sake of a catalog but for the sake of saving the world. And so, when I see these catalogs showing up in the mail, I get amped, I get excited, I wanna put my Christmas tree up, I wanna put more like, lights out, let's just do it already. Um, but I'll wait, I'll save it until Thanksgiving. Um, but it's the season, so no more to come about that, but I'm, I'm very much excited that the season, it's here. Thursday, uh, about five in the morning, Thursday, maybe you benefited from about five in the morning, storms came in Thursday. Were you guys awake or were you awakened by the storm? How uh, I many of you are like, I have no clue that it even happened. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Thursday, about five, 5.30 in the morning, storms came through, a lot of rain came through, especially here in our area where, where we're at, it's about five, 5.30. Um, no wind, just a lot of rain, a lot of water. Hannah left probably about 7 in the morning, and um, my poor wife has to travel, up, you know, not too far, but she has to go through an area where it floods, and so you kind of guess, did they close the gates already? Because turn around, don't drown, you know, that, those, those kind of gates. Um, and so she left around 7, and probably like 7, 10, 7, 11, it happened. Power went out at our house. Anybody lose power on Thursday morning? Okay, no, everybody was like, what happened at your house? Okay, we got rain, so much so that the power went out, and till about 11.30, Frank, what time did the power come back out? Yeah, 10.30, Frank lives not too far from here. It was 11.30 here, did it go out again? Because it went out again. Yeah, so that was, that was my Thursday. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of, uh, Hannah woke up on Friday and saw that the clock said 10 o'clock. She was like, it's 10 o'clock already? No, we just had to reset the clock. Um, but, um, so that was kind of our Thursday morning. But what was interesting is that I was in the shower when it happened. And so the power went out in the shower. And I could hear the girls, Daddy, the power went out. But they did so, so well. Because they knew where the lanterns were, they knew where the headlights were, headlamps were, and so when I came out of the shower, like there was light in our house. That wasn't from power, it was from our lanterns and headlamps, and they were like in our house, we were ready, we were ready to go. What the daughters did that morning reminded me, as I've been preparing this week, of what this section of Galatians does for us. Um, it is dark. For the Galatians in this moment, the moment in time that they're living in, the context in time, but if we fast forward to us, the context in time that if you don't know where the source of light is, then it's a pretty scary place to live in, in the dark. So I'm thankful the daughters knew what to do. They even took their headlamps to school, knowing that just in case power was out of their school, but they never lost power at their school because our principal kept the power on. He was on one of those lights keeping it on. <laughs> what Paul's going to do for us here in this section of Galatians is turn the lights on for us. Lord willing, 
when the lights are turned on for us here this morning, they remain on for us the rest of the days of our lives because of what God is doing through Paul writing for us. And so as we turn to Galatians chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 15 to 29. Now, I know it says happy homecoming on the sign. That's because it was homecoming week for Alba Heights. It was Hoko, right? Uh, but uh, 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 if I had a title on the, on the, on, for the sermon up on the front, it would say God turning the lights on. Because that's exactly what God is doing through this section of Galatians 3, 15 to 29. It will be up on the screen, Ephesians chapter 3, 15 through 29, but I hope you're also on your Bible apps or your physical Bibles. Notice the very first three words, brothers and sisters. Just take note of that. I'm going to read this slide and then we'll come back to this. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. So, so um, Paul's writing, just as one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. So brothers and sisters, l let me take an example for everyday life. This is Paul writing to a group of people he dearly cared for, so much so that he, sh he, he showed himself in this region. Remember, this isn't just one church, a uh, church. This is a group of churches, probably six or seven churches in one region known as Galatia. And, and, and he addresses them from Galatians 1 to Galatians 3 in this letter. He appeals to these peoples with this title, all the believers in the Galatian region. He, he addresses another group of people in this letter, um, to you false teachers, uh, Judaizers. He even calls them, as we saw last week in Galatians 3 verse 1, uh, to you fools. Right? Remember that from last week? Um, if you read the Message Remix, which is a paraphrased version, uh, Eugene Peterson writes, he translates, you crazy Galatians. But remember, it wasn't like a, 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 like a, a term of like uh, uh, waving a finger or, or looking down on crazy fools. They're saying, you who hears this head knowledge about Jesus and you don't put it into practice, just as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you are foolish if you're not practicing what you're hearing. That's to you fools. He addresses them as bewitched in Galatians 3, verses 1, 2, and 3, right? Uh, who has bewitched you? Who has cast a spell on you? He, he refers to them also in Galatians 3 as, as, as those who redeemed. I'm, I'm writing to you as redeemed individuals, meaning God has stirred your heart through His Holy Spirit in such a way that now you believe you are followers of Jesus. And then again here in Ephesians 3 verse 15, brothers and sisters. Now I point all of that out first and foremost. It's extremely important that Paul is writing to these people and to us as someone he really cares, as those he really cares for, as those he's trying to really get across something from his heart to their heart, from his mind to their mind, that I've got a message for you, brothers and sisters, Judaizers, false teachers, fools, bewitched, redeemed, brothers and sisters, I've got something for you. I want to bring it to you on your level. So he says, let me take an example from everyday life. Now, Paul's everyday life is different from our everyday life. Remember in chapter 1, Paul kind of gives his, um, he's defending who he is as a person in Christ. And he gives these, these credentials, if you will. He says, I'm different from those that are in Jerusalem. Um, I'm different from those who are uh, the apostles, that Jesus calls to be apostles. I'm different in the sense that I was educated from, it's the best education that a Jew can get, I've got that education. I've got that type of credentialing. Uh, PhD, you call me doctor, is, is what he's saying, because I've got that type of education in, in the education system sense of a term. But I'm also a Hebrew of Hebrews. Like, I'm from the Benjamites. Like, I, I've got the familial line. Like, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. So I go all the way back 
in my family life. And I, I, I was zealous for the family. Like I'm a Pharisee. It, meaning that, remember the Pharisees in Jesus' time? Like you adhere to the strict law. This, 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 this. Um, so the law that we find from Moses, the Ten Commandments, that was then stretched into 600 plus laws that you would adhere to. Like I am zealous for the law, Pharisee of Pharisees. And in my everyday context, there is this life that is being lived in such a way according to the law that I'm going to give you a practical example here. Look at the next slide. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds. Do you see the difference in word there? One is singular seed, one is plural seeds. Meaning many people, but, and to your seed, singular, meaning one person who is Christ. So what, what Paul is doing here is, is, is often we, late and I, stress this so much. Paul is pointing what? Backward to the Old Testament. Paul is pointing backward to the, these individuals who are in this region of Galatia, especially those who are of Jewish origin first and foremost, and even those who we call Gentiles, who are of, uh, of mixed nationality, race, education, background, diversity, they know that there's this tradition that God has with His people. Some of it it was even in the written form, most of it, which was in the oral form, from Genesis to Malachi. But everyone knew Abraham. We said it last week, right? You know the song. Father Abraham, and son, and son, and father, I am one of them, so are you. So, some of you were really excited about that song. <laughs> so let's just praise the Lord, right? Right, our left arm. Sit down. Everybody knew Father Abraham. The promise in Genesis 15, to promises and follow all the way to Genesis 22, where, where God promised um, Abraham, look on a clear day and see those stars. The nation that will come from you cannot even, you can't even count that nation. And the promise we're going to see, we'll see this again here in, in Genesis 22. Um, the faithfulness of Abraham to follow what God has for him as instruction. So much so that he raised the knife to sacrifice his son. There's this promise that a seed. So, well, first and foremost, we see that um, Paul is addressing people he really cared for, brothers and sisters. That's number one. Number two, what we see here, and we can circle it three times in this passage right here, seed, singular, seed, circle, seed, seed, seed. Genesis 22, 18 says this, and it's not up there, but I'll read it to you. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you obey me. This is the Abraham and Isaac moment. He took his knife to slay his son, but God stopped him and provided in that moment. Remember, in the thicket. His seed will come to intervene, to intercede, to be provided for. An offspring. Now, there's a couple things that I, I, want, to, I want to point out here. First, this word nation. In the Latin word, nation or nations is the same word Gentile, which is extremely interesting. Gentiles were, were looked down upon in this first century context. If the, the, the Jews... Look down on the Gentiles. 
But do you remember the significant moment before Jesus ascends that we have in Matthew 28? It's called the Great Commission. Go, right? Go where? You're going to the nations to preach, teach, baptize, disciple with the authority that Jesus has. I'm, I'm extending that authority to you to be about the nations. There was a promised seed for the nations. Now that is extremely significant that we don't get so narrow-minded that this redemption, this saving work that we sing about and that we study is not just for us in this room, but it's for the nations. We see overtones of that in what we say and because He lives, right? They, at just the right time, God loved this world so much and because He lives, everyone lives. They find faith in Him. They find hope in Him. They find rest in Him. They find firm foundation in Him. We sing that too. Paul continues, what I mean by this, what I mean by this is that the law was introduced 430 years later. It does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. Okay, so this is extremely significant here to the seed idea. 430 years later. So the moment from when God delivered his people in Egypt to the moment of Jesus Christ is what Paul is talking about. Now, the promise in the law and the promise of the seed. Now, I promise this is thick. I was not really excited to preach this section of Galatians. Because it just seems like, Paul, what the heck are you talking about here? You said, I'm going to give you an everyday example, and this everyday example does not make sense. We're going to get there, I promise, so bear with me. The promise of the seed that we see in Genesis 22, and the promise of the law that came to God's people after he delivered them, Remember, on the mountain, God delivered this law, this promise of the Ten Commandments and the law that Moses wrote down. Those two law, laws is the tension that we find in this region of Galatians, for the Galatians. This tension of, um, well, they are Jewish, they didn't grow up with the law. They didn't adhere to the law. They're not living in the law. Yet, they want faith in Christ because of what Christ did by living and dying and coming to life again. Well, they have to now adhere to the law. So that's where um, the tension of, well, they must be circumcised. These men must be circumcised. That's what the law says. Um, the, 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 they're not adhering to the festivals or to the, the, the preparation of the food as to what the law says. You must do Jesus, faith in Jesus, plus those things. Because that's what the law says. So that's this tension here. The promise of the seed, singular seed, Jesus, and the promise of the law is what's messing everyone up here. And, and Paul writes, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously conceived, established by God, and thus do away with the promise. Let, let me make it even more clear if you aren't already messed up, because I'm already messed up too. So let me try to make it very clear. The law provided by Moses does not change the promise the one to come that is Jesus. It doesn't change it. It doesn't extinguish it. And vice versa. Jesus doesn't extinguish, change, or eradicate the law that Moses provided. No, no. What, what's happening here is that the law that was provided by Moses was intended to draw people to rightness in God, and that rightness in God could not be attained 
by men and women themselves. There was not enough hand washing that could be done to save you from sin. There's not enough animals to be sacrificed that can save you because of your sins. There's not enough rituals, festivals, feasts. There are not enough pilgrimages to Jerusalem that can save us because of the sin that we have. But we know that that seed who was promised came. And it was Jesus. Ultimately, as sacrifice once and for all to do what the law could not do. Yet the law draws us to that seed. Look at what it says next. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. So remember, they're living by the law. They're living by circumcision. So if you're going to live by that, then you don't need Jesus. Which is a heavy statement. But God, in His grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. Uh, let's, let, let's continue this. Um, why then was the law given at all? Great question, Paul. Because I'm really confused now. I'm even more confused. Why do we even have this? Right? It was added because of the transgressions until the seed, you notice capital S, seed, to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. Now this, this verse right here, verse 19, points to verse 24, which we're going to get at here in a little bit. Um, the law is important this way. I know, can you? I know. The law was, in, was here given... Um, when I think of this part of scripture, I think of my first grade teacher, Miss Saab. Anybody have that one teacher that you can look back to and you're like, she was, she laid down the law, or he laid down the law. Anybody have that teacher? No, am I the only one that had that teacher? Or maybe I was just that only one that was that kid? Yeah, so here's what I remember. I don't remember, my, I remember kindergarten, Missy Nehosa was so brilliant and awesome. Missy Nehosa came to mine and Hannah's wedding. That's how much I love my kindergarten teacher. Uh, Miss, Miss Gonzalez in second grade, Miss Fernandez in third grade, Mrs. Ferguson, uh, uh, Miss Lotus in fourth grade, Miss Ferguson in fifth grade. Like, I remember those teachers, brilliant, awesome teachers. I don't remember much about Miss Sob except for this. There was one time that I didn't get the week's golden star, which means on Friday I didn't get the special snack. And it broke my heart. And I've been in counseling with it this moment. <laughs> there was something I did that week. I don't even know what it was. But Miss Saab, my first grade teacher, laid down the law so much so that I didn't get the star, which means I was humiliating all my friends because everyone else had a star on the chart in the classroom. And that week, I did not have a star. And that stayed up for nine weeks. Second, it was devastating because I didn't get the golden grams on Friday, like everyone else got Golden Grams. And I vividly remember this going home without Golden Grams. And that's a big deal. But the law was laid down. The law was given and entrusted to a mediator. Um, there's other words there that are used in, in the translation in that verse there in verse 19. Um, the word might be tutor. The word might be teacher. The word might be guide. Whatever the word is for you, it's not a good enough word. But there was this individual in the first century that a parent would hire that individual for their child to at times lay down the law. Literally, this figure in history in that first century was given a rod. And if that kid didn't do what they were supposed to do, yeah. It's like that moment, maybe you had this experience, like your parents telling you, you go pick out a stick because I'm gonna use that stick right now, right? You know what that stick was used for? Lay down the law, right? To remind you of the instruction. 
That is no longer needed because the seed was promised, the one to come to intercede, to pay the price that you could not pay anymore on your behalf. Or, or, or no one else could pay on your behalf. But the seed came. We see this in the next screen. Look at verse 20. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. It continues. Is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if the law had been given that could impart life, the righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But, verse 22, but Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised, and here it is, you want to underline, circle, square, highlight something, here it is. Being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The mediator is one God, and by grace, through faith, Remember, that's Paul's overarching message here, starting in chapter 1. Grace through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The promised seed was the one to come and that we believe in by faith, through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Okay. Here's where it gets a little more clear. Verse 23. If you've like glazed over, like let's just go. Here it is. We're going. Verse 23. I even put a little yellow mark on the word before to remind myself. Okay, here's where we go now. So if you're tracking, here we are. Verse 23. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law. That's where we feel this tension. Where if I just do this, and this, and this, I will be good enough. That's often how we live, right? October, I'm going to church every Sunday. And if I do that, then I might achieve, and you can fill in the blank. Um, 1031, if you haven't heard this already, um, we have set our alarms. Some of you have heard your alarms today. Thank you. We are setting our alarms. 1031 every day to pray intentionally. God, we give you our streets. Whatever the name of your street is, Broadway College, where this physical location is, God, we give you the streets, and we give you the people who operate on those streets. The street that our schools are on, our workplaces are on, the places we frequent. We give you those streets. We give you the people who operate on them. Capture our hearts again, is what we're praying at 1031 every day. That's why we're setting alarms. We're praying intentionally for one another. God, capture our hearts. God, forgive us for when we operate in such a way that it matters more the things that we do because we think we can accumulate good things, good works, to pay for our sin. God, forgive us because it cannot. And that's what Paul's getting at here. The law is great. It was entrusted it was entrusted to men and women long ago and it gave parameters it gave guidelines it gave instruction certainly we want to live in such a way where we're not lying do not lie certainly we want to live in such a way where we're not murdering one another do not murder certainly we're operating in such a way we're not stealing do not steal right so it gives great parameters and guidelines and a great foundation to stand on Ultimately, it points us to the one that through faith in which we live with Jesus Christ. We are no longer in custody of the law, is what Paul's saying. Locked up until the faith that was come would be revealed. Okay, we know what that's like. We have been set free. No longer ball and chain to the world and our sin. We have been set free. You know what it feels like to be set free? I don't know any 
physical representation for you exactly, but you know what it's like to be held captive by fear, anxiety, worry, and you're locked up, living in such a way that you feel so locked up. And you also know what it's like to be set free from that, and that's exactly what's happening here, what Paul's pointing to, faith in Christ has come, it has been revealed, and it has set us free. Look at verse 24. So that the law was our guardian. Again, Paul's saying the law was good. It was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith in Him. We are made right by what Christ has done and what Christ is doing. And, and we talked about this in Sunday school this morning. That, that He who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. So Paul writes to the church in Philippi in Philippians. Uh, God has started a work in you. Now that you've been set free, he who began that work is going to be faithful to complete that work in you. So you are no longer locked up. You are no longer confined by sin. But by faith in him, you are set free. And what is more, and where this passage comes to the climax here, at the end of chapter 3, the, the, the crux of this all, and if you're taking notes, here it is. Our identity is found in Christ. I'm going to say that again. Our identity is found in Christ and Christ alone. If there is one thesis of this chapter, if there is one thesis of this letter to this region of people in Galatia, and to us as we read this and as we study this, one main thing for us to keep the main thing is that our identity is found in Christ alone and no one or nowhere else. This speaks so relevant and real to our society today, doesn't it? Because there are so many other places or other people that we can find our identity in. Other things, right? We share something, we share our names. And most often, what's the first thing that we ask each other? So what do you do? And so our identity is wrapped in this idea that we're asking one another, well, I do this, or I'm retired, or, well, man, I'm looking to do this, right? But our identities are not in those things. It's in Christ. Look what Paul says next. So, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Underline, circle, square. That should be ripped out of your Bibles and tacked up somewhere this week that you are reminded of it every day. Or if you don't want to rip your Bibles open, then write it somewhere and put that somewhere. Screenshot it and put it as your lock screen. So, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized, key word here, into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. What Paul's doing here is so brilliant, but we miss it. Like, we, we read the word baptism, we're like, oh, that's great. Yeah, everyone was baptized. You must be baptized. No, but he's giving a word picture for us to see. And so would we not miss it? You have seen someone get baptized, or you've been baptized yourself. And if you have not been baptized, I'd love to have a conversation with you about baptism, believer's baptism. Because it's this picture the water doesn't save you in baptism. The act of being baptized doesn't save you. But it is an outward rep representation of what has now happened to you, being set free because of what Jesus has done and is doing for you in your life. But it's a vivid picture. When you're baptized, we here practice that you are fully immersed in the water. And, and it happens up here, right? So maybe you've watched the baptism here, and, and, and when we put them in a immerse, fully immersed under the water, you don't see them for a brief moment. Now, I don't hold you down long, but for a brief moment, you don't see them, right? Right? That's what Paul, the picture is painting here. For you were all baptized, and for a brief moment, you shared in that same moment. Where you died to sin, just as Christ died 
and paying the price for sin. And what's the next part of the picture? Raised to life. The individual comes back to life out of that water. And there's this physical representation, this, this picture that Paul is trying to paint here, that now that you come up out of the water, clothe yourselves with Christ. Our identity is found in Christ, with Christ, and clothed with Christ. Paul writes over and over to all the churches. All his letters, he has some sort of thought or idea that he shares with this idea of how are you getting dressed? Now he's not talking about the clothes that we're putting on. Often he says, clothe yourself in kindness and love and humility. Hospitality, forgiveness, gentleness, self-control, righteousness. It matters just as much as you wash, hopefully clean, iron, and prepare your clothes for the day. It matters just as much as if you're putting on these attributes that are aligned with Jesus Christ every single day. If we are not clothing ourselves in such a way, something's off. And the truth is, it's hard to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and forgiveness and love and self-control and righteousness, right? It's often as maybe we get our foot in and we're like, nah, not today. And yet Paul is giving us your identity is found in Christ Jesus. You are, you are his children. You're sons and daughters. Look what he says next. If you belong, oh, no, no, no. oh I went too far. Can you go to the next one before we come back to this one? If you belong, to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Now we're going back to the plural. I know Paul's confusing us. So this is not a capital letter. So we know that this is talking about the generations to come that were promised from, and not as the Messiah seed, capital S seed. But if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and you are heirs according to that promise. So not only are we sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, but we are heirs. That, that we are benefactors to everything lavished that is part of his household. That is huge. Okay, go back to the next. The, the, the first. Okay. This might be the only memorization verse that many of you have had. But here's this verse in the middle of this confusing section that brings life and parameters back from Paul. There is neither Jew, there is neither Gentile, there is neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. How many of you have seen this or know this verse already? Okay. There is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free nor there is male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul's reminding to those that are in this region and he's reminding us that humanly because of our flesh, because of our broken hearts and our broken minds, uh, we uh, view and deem people by the lenses that we operate in. And we give and draw lines to certain areas and avenues in which we hold higher people of esteem and we hold lower other people. 
and we decide who's of higher and who's of lower. And that's happening then for those in this region, and that happens for us today. And the truth is, if we want to be even pessimistic, it will continue to happen until Jesus comes. But those of us who have faith in Christ view from a different lens. And not only do we view from a different lens, but we operate from a different posture. And that's what Paul's getting at here. Because we're clothing ourselves, there is no Jew or Gentile. The, the walls are down. The, the barriers are down. Uh, the Gentiles don't have to become like you Jewish individuals by adhering to the law, which is the biggest thing that he's addressing. A slave nor free. Now, in, in, in our context, in the world that we live in today, when we see the word slave, we feel a little differently than what's actually happening here, because this was actually, the slave can be deemed as a vocation in Paul's context, in this everyday context here, that some were deemed as slaves because they had to do certain things for those who paid them to do those things. But they were treated ill. They were treated wrongly. And Paul said, stop that if you're clothed with Christ. Male and female, we know the tension there. Men can do this, and women can do this, or men can do this, and women can't do this. And so what Paul is saying here, stop. Those that were clothed with Christ don't operate in such a way. Not because of who you are, but because you are one in who Christ is who is the Redeemer once and for all. Paul takes intentional time to set this straight. It's heavy and it's real and it was necessary then and it's necessary now. Um, in, in, in chapter 4, um, as we're going to see uh, next week, Paul kind of continues with this message. Like, 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 we're operating differently, friends, brothers and sisters. Um, you foolish Galatians, you Judaizers, um, um, you trying to cause and stir up trouble, you redeemed. You who are um, dressing yourselves, clothing yourselves in Christ, we're different. And it's not because of what we have done or who we are, but no, it's because for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let me end with this. If we belong to Christ, if we are children, if we are heirs, we must operate different. And most importantly, we must connect ourselves to the source that sets us free. And so, um, traditions go out the window compared to Christ. Um, uh, uh, notions that we've done this this way for this long go out the window compared to finding uh, uh, springboarding or energy strength that's in Christ and Christ alone. The world, Monday through Friday, operates this way, goes out the window compared to now it's time to leave here and operate Monday through Friday and clothing ourselves in the way Christ wants us to clothe ourselves. And so would we start today to humble ourselves in such a way that we begin to operate apart from ourselves and with Christ leading. Would you pray with me, Father God? God, we um, in this room um, posture ourselves, position ourselves, claim to be followers of you, Jesus. God, we we, we um, 
rest in hope that is at just the right time God sent you, Jesus, to be um, our Savior, our Redeemer. And so we thank you for redeeming us, for setting us free. We thank you for um, our identity. Our identity as Jew or Gentile or slave or free. Our identity as male or as female is found in you. And because of that, we view the world differently and we operate in the world differently. So first and foremost, forgive us if we haven't viewed the world differently or operated differently. But would today be the day that we look to you for strength, knowing that we are one in you. Give us the strength, give us the insight and the, the thought to be gentle and humble and loving and forgiving, hospitable and kind. But people who, uh, because we chase after you, serve and love those that are around us. And so I thank you that together we get to do these things. We thank you for Paul's instruction and Paul's uh, uh, guidance to bring us back and point us to you, Jesus. And so as we leave here, protect us and provide and watch over us and use us in all these ways. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, have a great week. Hope to see you. We have dinner and study on Wednesday. See you soon. Bye.